Hey, it's Kimberly Adams, and you're watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. I'm coming to you from my bedroom. Uh, do us a favor and hit that subscribe button below so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks. Yep, let's just go. Great. Let's just go. Let's just go. Oh, look. See, Kimberly yes. says it, and it starts. Man, hey, everybody. That's Scott Rizdahl. This is uh, Make Me Smart, the Tuesday edition. That voice you hear, it is not mine. It is also not Molly Wood. She's off this week because she's a sane human being. Kimberly Adams is in for us all week, helping us out um, on all of the stuff we need to talk about, which is a lot. Today... Uh, we are going to do, um, we're going to, I, I, I don't, I don't even know how to think about this. It's like, we're going to triangulate. We're going to triangulate this current moment. We're going to triangulate Black Lives Matter. We're going to triangulate, uh, Pride Month and we're going to triangulate. And I know that we've got four things going on here, Juneteenth. Um, and because there is a moment here that's happening, which we think is worth, um, examination. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the fact that you said triangulate, consider, whatever, but uh, so often yeah. people talk about these things as, as a binary, but it's it's not. Mm. We, we are human beings who are capable of thinking about lots of things at once, and hopefully we can all do it in a nuanced manner. So in New York on Sunday, thousands of people gathered for the Black Trans Lives Matter rally, and then in Los Angeles you have this huge gay and queer presence at the All Black Lives Matter march in Hollywood and across the country. We're seeing these two movements uh, really come together, and all of this is at the same time that there are these big news stories kind of unfolding. Um, we have on Friday, the Trump administration rolled back health care protections for mm -hmm. transgender people. Then just yesterday, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in this landmark case, which we talked about, extending workplace uh, protections to LGBTQ folks. And that's being hailed as a huge and, and surprising victory. And then even today, the Trump administration has this new executive order out on, you know, quote unquote, reforming police. <laughs> Mm -hmm. A lot, <laughs> which, which we are, we, yeah, which we are going to get to when we start talking about the news. But right now, uh, we've got Keith Boykin on the phone. He is a lawyer. He's a journalist. Uh, he's on CNN. He worked in the Clinton administration. Um, he wrote a book back in 1996, actually. So Keith, I'm dating you. I apologize. Uh, called "One More River to Cross: Black and Gay in America." Keith, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Let me ask you, first of all, um, if you agree with the premise of this conversation, that this is a this is a moment now where a bunch of things are coming together and it's and it's a moment to, to try to talk about it. I definitely think this is a moment. It, it's unusual uh, to have all these different forces converging at one time um, where we have um, the issue of LGBTQ rights and um, African-American rights, civil rights, and uh, the rights of all people being discussed at one time because of this convergence. So you're right to point out the, the Black Trans Matter march that took place in Brooklyn. You're right to point out the, the uh, LA Pride march that was also convened along with uh, the protest against uh, uh, police brutality. Because what's happening is that people are realizing there's sort of a synergy between these two, that there are people who are discovering that there's a connection between all these different things. So I agree it is a moment. Well, can we can you talk a little bit more about people discovering that there's a synergy yeah. between yeah. that? Because people discovering it, it emphasizes the fact that some folks have known about this for a long time. Well, yeah, there are a lot of people who've lived in the intersection of race, gender, sexuality, gender identity, ethnicity, and other different types of uh, aspects of who we are for many, many years. I've talked about those intersections. That's one of the things I talked about in my first book, uh, One More River to Cross, for example, Black and Gay in America. But if you are black and you happen to be a woman or happen to be a person who's with disabilities or happen to be a person who's LGBTQ or any other uh, aspect of your identity, as Professor Kimberly Crenshaw has written about when she talks about intersectionality, what that means for a lot of people is that you take all these different aspects of your identity with you wherever you go. You can't just be black. You can't just be a woman. You can't just be queer. You, you have to be all those things. And sometimes those things get uh, separated. And what's happening now is that people are realizing there's a connection between those things. There's a connection between uh, the different oppressions that people have, have experienced. A lot of times these various groups have been 
pitted against one another uh, in a sense of sort of a, a hierarchy of oppression. And instead, what we're seeing now is that people are realizing that it doesn't matter which group was first oppressed or whether they're identically oppressed or which one is more oppressed. The, the question is, why should any group of people be oppressed? So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we can't say that Black Lives Matter unless we include black women's lives. Uh, we, we have to talk about people like Breonna Taylor and Sandra Bland. When we talk about Black Lives Matter, we also have to talk about black queer lives. So we have to talk about people like Tony, about Tony McDade, uh, and we have to talk about people like Nina Pop. Uh, and so when we talk about all these different issues, there is a connection. Uh, and the fact that people are protesting in the streets and have been, and in some cases what people might call rioting or in other cases a rebellion, is a reflection of how the queer movement got started in the first place. If you look back to Stonewall in 1969, it started because black and Latino drag queens, transgender people, along with LGBTQ people from the community, fought back against police brutality. That's what the Stonewall Rebellion was all about. It was about a fight against police brutality. And now black people are fighting back against police brutality as well. America's never liked this, never liked to see violence, but it seems to be the only thing that gets people to pay attention. It's what got people to pay attention in 1969 and started a movement, and certainly is what getting people, get, is what's getting people to pay attention right now. Has it always been um, a smooth relationship, this, these intersections, or have there been tensions? And, and certainly, you know, recently in Los Angeles there have been, there's been news coverage of that, but, but I wonder historically whether everything's always been um, um, a recognition that fundamentally the cause is the same. No, it's it's never really been a smooth transition. You know, if you look back at uh, coalition politics, it always involves a certain amount of distrust and, and a certain amount of, of yeah. forced trust. Uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan from Sweet Honey and the Rock wrote an essay about this uh, in, an, in a, a wonderful book called Homegirls, a black feminist anthology. And she wrote an essay about coalition politics where she talks about coalitions mean you have to get people who don't necessarily see eye to eye with you on every cause, but see eye to eye with you on the larger cause and come together for a specific purpose. That may mean you disagree from time to time and you go back to your own community and you come back to the coalition and you work together. But a coalition is not a womb necessarily where you're going to be supported. It's a, co it's a place where you come together and you support the larger cause. So I think that's important for people to understand that. As somebody who's, been, who's, who's both black and gay, I've experienced racism in the LGBTQ community, and I've experienced homophobia in the black hmm. community. And it's not pleasant from either side. And a lot of other people who are in my, my position, black, queer, or black, same gender loving people, have that same experience. So we just want to be our full selves. We don't want to have to take our, one of our identities away from a, a particular space because we are not welcome in that space. That's what true liberation means. Mm -hmm. so Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm -hmm. So what makes this moment different then? Because you've just laid out a very clear history of sort of the ebbs and flows of these groups working together or not, and rightfully pointing out sort of the homophobia that has existed traditionally in some parts of the black community. What makes this moment different? I think what's different about this moment is that people are realizing that they're fed up, um, and they're willing to say they're fed up, and they're realizing they have power. Uh, and that's unusual. I mean, in the past, people have had protest movements. If you go back to Occupy Wall Street or even the beginning of Black Lives Matter or anti-war protests, and they would come for a while and they'd fizzle out after a, a certain amount of time. Part of that was because people had to go back to their jobs and their schools and things like that. Now we have a pandemic that is still going on, which has forced people to stay at home and not to go to work or not to go to school. So that means that they have more time on their hands. And they're also realizing that when they push back, that there is change. They're realizing that if you push back against the, the, the policing in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis City Council responds. If you push back against the police department in Atlanta, the Atlanta, the Atlanta police chief resigns. If you push back against the police accountability what took place with a, a white man, 75 years old, being pushed by the police, the Buffalo police respond in the Buffalo police respond in a negative way. But, but, but you see that there is, that there is there, whatever, whatever action there is, there is a response, there's a, a counteraction. I think it's just a frustration. You know, we've gone through the coronavirus, we're going through the protests, we've gone through all these different things, and we're seeing that there is a possibility to make change now. And this is, I think this is perhaps the best opportunity we've had to move forward in quite some time because the dialogue is changing. So a lot of people who are in the middle, so to speak, or moderate lane of uh, democratic politics or progressive politics uh, feel uncomfortable with some of the language that's going on. For example, defund the police mm -hmm. or abolish the police. Police. Those are very controversial ideas for a lot of people. 
But if you go back in time 20 years ago, the idea of marriage equality was a controversial idea. And it took the fact that people pushed for marriage equality to get the democratic establishment to even accept the idea of civil unions as being sort of a fallback or a failsafe. And then by getting marriage equality, it made it easier for the Supreme Court just this week to issue a decision to allow uh, equal treatment and employment discrimination. So I think what the groups are learning is that you can't just push for half of what you want. You have to push for everything you want. or Otherwise, you'll be comp- compromising and negotiating against yourself. This pushing that's happening, is it who, against whom are you pushing? Are you pushing at the national level? Is this a state and local issue as it is for Black Lives Matter with police brutality and and that kind of thing? I mean, there's there's obviously there's a lot of moving parts, right? I think it's pushing at every level, particularly when we're dealing with policing, because policing is not typically a national issue. It's a it's a state and local issue. A state and local governments uh, control the predominant resources in terms of policing. And people are pushing for the police chiefs and local mayors and city councils to be more accountable to the public. They're pu- pushing for their state uh, executive, chief executives and governors to, to reconsider the way that they deploy the National Guard forces. They're pushing for the president and the, the White House to, 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 to reconsider the use of tear gas against protesters or for Congress to reconsider mm-hmm. legislation that might move forward on policing reform. So I think it's happening at all three levels. It's not just happening at one level. But there's an old saying in the environmental movement, environmental movement, which is that if you think globally and act locally, I think people are doing mm-hmm. this. They're reimagining the world. Uh, what kind of world do we want to live in? How do we create that? And you do that, you do that by create, taking local action or local steps to change things to get to that world. How sustainable do you think this current coalition is? Because right now, unlike a lot of previous moments, where there are a lot more white people out in the streets pl- protesting with black people, um, there is this synergy that we're talking about between sort of the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of these pride events. Um, I'm curious where you see this going in terms of next steps and, and the, this coalition. Well, it's important just to step back a bit in history to understand that the the black civil rights movement was always uh, was always helped by black queer people, uh, people like James Baldwin, um, who was a luminary in the in the movement and also a black gay man, or Lorraine Hansberry, who wrote A Raise in the Sun, who was a black lesbian woman, or Bayard Rustin, who was a black gay man who organized Dr. King's famous March on Washington speech in, in March on Washington in 1963, where he gave his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, and that history continued even into the Black Lives Matter movement. Two of the three uh, key principal organizers or founders of the Black Lives Matter movement were black queer women. So automatically from the beginning, there's an intersectionality that that takes place, the people who are understanding the need to have these sort of overlapping uh, uh, conversations that we're, that we're engaging in. I don't expect that to change. I think that people have gotten to the point where that, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Um, whether or not the coalition is a comfortable one is a different question because there will be uh, points where a group's interests may not seem like they align. But I don't think you can go back and say, well, we're only going to focus on black people. We're only going to focus on, on queer people. I mean, even the LGBTQ movement had this problem a few years ago when there was a tendency to focus only on equality for sexual orientation. They were willing to sort of write off gender identity and forget about trans inclusion because it wasn't politically feasible, people thought. But one of the things that we're learning now again, is that if you push for everything you want, it makes it a lot easier. It's also the reason why I say to all the, all the other people who are in politics that you shouldn't be concerned or afraid of these conversations, because the fact that people are pushing for what you may consider to be extreme or radical proposals makes it easier for you to push for a proposal that you couldn't have even imagined two or three years ago, or even two or three months ago, um, that would have been radical then, but now it might be considered moderate. So I think it gives opportunity for people who really want progressive change to move forward and to work hand in hand with people on the inside and people on the outside. This is kind of a mushy question, but do you think this time is different? Are you, are you more hopeful now? Well, that's a tough question. <laughs> You know, I, in some ways, I am hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful a little bit because I think that um, I see people in the community, young people, stepping up and speaking out. And, you know, for a long time, people have been very critical of millennials and Gen Z and all the people who they said weren't really standing up and doing enough. These people are standing up. I've been out in some of these protests in New York City. I've been covering them. 
I was arrested with some of the protesters uh, a week or two ago, actually, and I had a chance to spend time in jail with these protesters and see what, what exactly they're hmm. they're fighting for. And these people are determined. They don't mind going to jail. I saw just a few days ago there was a young man on television uh, here in New York who said he'd been arrested, uh, he'd been protesting 14 days in a row and arrested nine times, and he had no plans to stop. He was going to go go to work every day and come back and go out back to the protest lines. That's that's incredible, and I think that is different. Uh, we haven't seen anything like that in my lifetime. Uh, certainly, if you go back to the civil rights movement era, then we saw examples of, of that behavior. But this is imp- unprecedented for the, the new age, and I think it's a hopeful sign. Keith Boykin is a CNN commentator and author. He has a new book coming out next year called Race Against Time, Politics of a Darkening America. Keith, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. That, sorry, I'm just keying off his book title for his next book, The Politics of a Darkening Time. Uh, I wonder uh, if he will, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of symbolism in that book title, but I wonder if he'll reconsider. I wonder if it actually is a, a brightening time given the events of the past month. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's interesting because I read that as sort of the demographic shifts in America. Yeah, 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 that... yeah. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah. I'll certainly be grabbing it. Uh, can't was, wait to Yeah, that was good. That was good stuff. That was, it's, God, there's just so much going on right now. Yeah, but I really love the historical context that yep. he shared yep. about that. You know, as as we said at yep. the top, this is new to a lot of people, but this overlap has been forever in this movement. Um, yep. And it's just sort of the ebbs and flows of it and people sort of coming to terms because, I mean, I, I certainly, you know, can speak to within my own black American family uh, when mm-hmm. my uncle came out or when my brother came out, it was not a good look at all and so yeah to, hmm? yeah well i was just gonna so or is this one of your uncle david's right yes it's one of my uncle david's okay so so he's not he's not a young man now how old was he when he came out uh formally uh in the 90s so let's see he's in his 60s yeah. so i guess he was in like his late 30s or something right but right. um you know my, my family ostracized him And we've gone from that to now everybody loves both Uncle David's. (laughs) Right, 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 right. Holy cow. Holy cow. Mm. Mm. Well, it seems like we need a break. I believe that's how y'all do this. Uh, But we want to do a call out (laughs) specifically. (laughs) Look, I'm learning. I'm learning. This is You're here now. You're one of us. Come on. You're on the team. I know. I know. It's not you. It's we. It's we, it's we. Okay, but we do need to do a call. We need to do a call out for our listeners who identify directly with these issues and ideas. So tell us what you think about these moment, this moment, these protests, this this change that we're witnessing. We want to hear from you. So record yourself in a voice memo and send it to make me smart at marketplace.org and we'll be right back. And we're back. Now we're back. We're officially back. Once you hear the boom. Um, so okay. I think this is interesting. I think that there, there is a theme of these two news items that you and I separately picked. And I would I mm-hmm. would just suggest it's a theme of things that are being talked about, which really aren't going to actually happen and or make a difference. And I'm happy to explain myself as we get to these items. Mine is this report in Bloomberg today that the Trump administration wants to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure as a way to get this economy going, to which I will only say, oh, my goodness, it's infrastructure week. It's infrastructure week. Again. Oh, I cannot I mean, infrastructure weeks. I mean, mean, look, we desperately need infrastructure in this country. And we should totally spend a trillion dollars to do it. But that is simply not apparently happen. also yeah, since I we can spend uh, money with no consequences at this point. I, there's I know, that. So know, why right? not spend it yeah, on I infrastructure? Just, absolutely. I just I think it's so interesting that this is being trotted out yet again as a thing that is going to save the economy, which really it could do some great good. But I don't actually think it's real. And that's my that's my commentary on the news of the day. Well, it's funny because here in, in the wonky world that is Washington, D.C., yes. Infrastructure Week has become this 
tongue-in-cheek shorthand for Mm -hmm. all of these uh, efforts that are announced with big fanfare but don't actually mean anything or that may or may not be a distraction strategy (laughs) from Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. happening in the news. So uh, it is not uncommon because it is Washington and it is not real America. I know, but you'll be out at a bar. Well, when we when we went out to bars, you know, someone's like, "Oh, it's infrastructure." Yeah, that's right. That's right. Infrastructure. Again. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, so so that's my entry in the category of things that that just simply just are not gonna have a a big impact. And now you go with yours, and I will explain my my prejudging of your item. Yeah. Uh, so today, as as we mentioned up top, the uh, Trump administration has this new executive order out, and the president uh, announced it. Uh, their effort to reform the way policing works in America, and the administration says they've been working on this for months and months and months, and this is just a way to incentivize police to engage in best practices. So they're not necessarily saying they're going to penalize police departments for engaging in bad practices, but they're going to tie like grant funding and other things moving forward mm. to say, I don't know, not allowing their police to put people in chokeholds or to engage in more community policing and to have more partnerships with, say, mental health services. And supposedly this is also going to include an effort to uh, track problem police officers so that they can't, I don't know, you know, engage in police brutality in one place and then mm-hmm. go move to another police department and do the same thing. Right. Now, this is my moment to bring up a story I reported a couple of weeks ago <laughs> okay, about the fact that under the Obama oh, the, administration, the, there was the, supposed the, the to data, be... The database story, right? This is the FBI database. Sorry, there was supposed to be yeah. an yeah, FBI yeah. database tracking use of force, and it they started collecting data voluntarily from police departments at the beginning of 2019 and they said that they were going to be releasing that data at least twice a year no data yet now granted it takes mm-hmm. a while to get this stuff together new data set one could make the argument that you know they need some time to get it together but when i pressed the fbi on this they said that about of police departments, only 40, well, only 40% of officers in America, which basically covers Mm -hmm. some of the bigger police departments, but that's wonky numbers. Anyway, only about 40% of officers are submitting data, even tracking whether or not they used force. And they said that they were going to release the data, and this is what they said, this summer, but no more detail than that. So. Right. Just right. It's I mean, pick. it's so you can have all these executive orders and what have you until the cows come home. But if people aren't following the rules and my example here is from like two weeks ago, uh, there were uh, protests and there was some violence in Louisville and uh, by the police. And oh, by the way, none of the Louisville police officers who had body cams on had turned their body cams on. Right. I mean, you know, come on, man. That's what I got. And that's why that's why I just it's my category of news today is stuff that will not actually work to resolve anything. Although, okay. although, yes. and here's my little dose of yes. optimism. Okay, good. <laughs> these <laughs> these initiatives being on the books and the administration, whether it be the Obama administration or the Trump administration, coming out and saying that they're doing this, it does give a space for journalists, the few of us that remain, uh, yeah, right. and community groups and individuals to follow up for accountability because democracy is yep. not a spectator sport. So if the Trump administration is saying they want um, more mental health awareness and advocacy and more, and they're tying funding to police departments doing better on these issues, then it gives uh, individuals within communities a tool to hold their police department departments to accountability and to you know make their decisions about what they're going to do next in terms of their engagement with our democracy. Yep, totally, one hundred percent agree. Absolutely, absolutely. Now we're moving on to the mailbag. Yes, we are. Yes, we. Hi, Kai we, and Molly. we are moving. This on. is Brent in Detroit. <laughs> this I is Rebecca we. from Baltimore. It was great to no, hear no, comments no, no. on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different, but maybe related thing. 
So we talked last week uh, about defunding the police, that phrase, what it means, how it's being applied, and and where it might take this um, conversation that we are all having now at a national level um, about some of these issues. Uh, we got to hear Duckett on the phone. He came on to explain it, and we got a bunch of comments on. And here is what Tim Johnson from Mishawaka, Indiana, had to say. Here you go. I will say that I am pretty new to this phrase, only hearing it for the first time in the past few weeks. At first blush, I was concerned to hear this phrase being coined. However, hearing some of the clarifications being made by activists and city councilors has really helped flesh out the, the idea a little. After taking a step back and trying to listen to all of the points being made about this issue, I completely agree that it's time for steps to be taken at the local and national level to demilitarize and restructure the police in our nation. I do, however, fear that the current ideas of defunding police forces and reallocating responsibilities to social service groups might be a trivialization of what we are really asking for. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, because, I mean, what at least protesters and activists are asking for is for police to not kill people in right. general uh, right. right and black people in particular especially you know for things like being drunk and asleep in a car or mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. of the other uh traumatic things that have happened um I mean, y you and I discussed this in, in one of our editorial meetings. I, too, was a little bit caught off guard by the, the defund the police language until I started yeah, yeah. doing some research into it. And I was just like, oh, yeah, why are the police the ones to respond to mental totally. health crises? Totally, totally. And why look, are they responding just to the, noise complaints? Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and to, to go back to this guy in, at the Wendy's in Atlanta... Uh, who was asleep in his car. Apparently, his sister lived, like, down the road, and he could have walked home. And I don't understand why you couldn't have a social services person, assuming we funded social services at the appropriate level, come to that scene instead of police officers. You know, that's that's kind yeah. of encapsulates the whole thing for me, you know? It's, um... Yeah. I'm very interested to see where this conversation goes, because, as, yep. as you mentioned earlier... A lot of what you know of police funding is tied to local communities, um, and especially in a moment where state and local tax revenues are really strapped because of COVID nineteen lockdowns and unemployment and healthcare costs and all these other things, um, everybody is going to really have to validate their budgets. And so I wonder how this is going to play into those debates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And look, it is absolutely a conversation to have, for sure. Full stop. Just want to say that. All right. So, last week on the Explainathon, ex yes. Explainathon, I've never said that word out loud. Explainathon <laughs> episode, Kai, mm. you took a question about whether or not what we're seeing in the stock market is a moral hazard or a situation where a company might be more inclined to taking on risk because basically they know that we're going to bail them out, we being taxpayers, government, mm -hmm. whatever. Anyway, you said that you don't think what's going on is a moral hazard scenario, and listener Eric Nore wanted to respond to that. And here is what he wrote. He said, I have to take issue with the framing of the current stock market rise as not being a product of ongoing moral hazard. Many of the largest U.S. companies collectively engage in share buybacks, leveraged share buybacks, and paying dividends. This occurred during the longest bull market ever and when they were reporting record profits. The fact that companies neglected to have money for the eventual downturn and knew that the feds and society would deem the damage of their negligence too dire to bear is the definition of a moral hazard. It is capitalism on the way up and socialism on the way down. Just like last time, there was a reason these buybacks were considered market manipulation and were illegal for most of the country's history. Is that true, that they were illegal for most of the country's history? Uh, yeah, it's it goes back to the sort of the 80s and when they were uh, permitted and and um, to some degree encouraged by tax policies and, and all the rest of this stuff. Look, I, I far be it for me to disagree with a listener, but we will disagree about this specific event. And and look, the companies that did these share buybacks, a lot of them have billions of dollars in cash. Um, cash was not the issue. Cash was not the issue. Anyway. You know, you know we talk. <laughs> 
there was a lot of discussion about companies sitting on this sitting on these mountains of cash and and mm -hmm. taking on all this corporate debt because debt was cheap i think it is less about companies uh not having the money and us having to save them it is about companies choosing not to spend the money they have on these things because they are trying to either preserve uh, shareholder value, and, and Scott Tong has done this huge thing in the past on shareholder value, mm -hmm. which if people mm -hmm. haven't listened to, they yeah. should. Um, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm more inclined to, to lean towards uh, the listener perspective here because um, I, I, it, it comes down to what the responsibility of a company is. And it is mm -hmm. very hard for me to kind of wrap my head around the idea that, yes, you were sitting on all of this cash, and you didn't pay your employees anymore, which means that the government basically ended up subsidizing your employees. Uh, many of these companies don't pay that much in taxes. <laughs> and so that means we as taxpayers are subsidizing their operations. And so uh, I don't know. I think that corporate America is necessary for the full functioning of the US economy, but there are a lot of things that could have been, been done better to make this crash and this moment we're in not as bad as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's totally fair. Totally fair. I know that was all over the place, but my feelings no, about it are look, all over this whole, the place this, too. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is a, it is a non-simple conversation to have. Um, okay. Make me smart question before we go. What is something you thought you knew, but later found out you were wrong about Aaron Perry on the biggest question of the moment, literally talking uh, about racism in America. Here you go. Hi, Kaya Molly. This is Aaron from New Hampshire. One thing I thought I knew, but just found out very recently I was wrong about, is that I thought my children ages seven and nine were too young for me to have conversations with them about racism. I always intended on having conversations about race with my children, but I always thought they needed to be older. But then I saw something on social media last week that changed my mind. It said something to the effect of, you don't want to let this moment go by without taking the opportunity to teach your kids about what this moment means. I came to think that if I want to raise boys who are going to be able to recognize racism and speak out against it, how can I expect them to do that if I have not taught them what racism is and how to recognize it? I knew it was going to be a hard conversation. But then I thought about all the mothers of black boys that have to teach their sons at a very young age how to interact with the police. If some mothers have to have those conversations, I owe it to them to teach my children how to recognize racism and what to do when they encounter it. I now understand that they are never too young for these tough conversations because I am hopeful that they will be the change that I so desperately want to see in the world. Yeah. Do you remember when your parents or family first started talking to you about racism, Kai? Oh, yeah, I was six. I was six when we were in England. Yeah, you bet. It was late 60s in England, which, you know, first of all, dates me and, oh, my gosh. Uh, but, but, you know, but, yeah, yeah, it's, I totally remember. You betcha. 100%. Yeah, I definitely, um, I remember I was in, I guess, like the first or second grade because uh, the school that I went to, they were very fond of like missionary stories. And there were all these stories about missionaries going to the sort of air quotes, dark continent and like staining their skin brown wow. and saving the savages wow. type deal. And uh, that led to some really blunt conversations in my family like with my parents mm -hmm. when I was like repeating what I was learning in school. And then uh, I think I got called the N word for the first time that I remember when I was eight. And then uh, around 10, my family started, my parents started talking to me about sort of lynchings and police brutality and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then probably not until I was like 12 or 13 did we actually start having the conversations about here's what you have to do when you're interacting with police. But I remember very clearly, um, you know, because I've – my dad said something to me when I was 12 because I was getting teased a lot at school. Um, and mm -hmm. then because I went to predominantly white school, predominantly black church, and I was getting teased in both <laughs> places for not fitting in. <laughs> 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 Which, oh man, sorry to laugh. Story oh of my, my life. <sighs> but I was complaining to my dad about this, and he, as a person who has just he experienced a lot of really 
terrible and violent racism in his life, he said to me, you have to always remember that you're never going to be black enough for black people, but to white people, the first thing they will always see you as is the N-word. And that was when I was 12. I, um, yeah, yeah, I don't, I mean, honestly, Kimberly, I don't even know what to do with that because it's so far outside my lived experience, you know? But it's really encouraging to hear people thinking about starting these conversations early. And yeah. I've had conversations uh, with, you know, our colleagues here at Marketplace who mm -hmm. in, you know, appropriate moments have asked them how to start that conversation with their young kids and if I had any resources that I could point them to mm. and are being purposeful about if they mm -hmm. do, if they are in primarily, you know, predominantly white environments, going outside of themselves and their own comfort zones to make sure that their kids are exposed, and that's encouraging. I, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. The whole comfort zones thing, um, because it's 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 these are such hard conversations to initiate because it's you, you almost don't know and and look. <laughs> privileged, uh, you know, middle-aged white guy here, you almost don't know what questions to start asking, if that makes any sense at all, you know? Um, yeah. Anyway, that's probably a whole other episode. Whew. Yeah, all shall right. we? I think we're done. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> go ahead, you. Oh, all right. So uh, don't forget to sign up for the Make Me Smart newsletter at marketplace.org slash newsletters. Back tomorrow with the What Do You Want to Know Wednesday. And Make Me Smart yep. is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producer, Ben Hethcote, who checked out my video beforehand. Thanks, Ben. And our <laughs> video intern, Ethan, Ethan Peretz, and our writer-producer, Erica Phillips. Drew Joust at uh, Drove Today. Garrett Lang mixed the program. Our theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez. The executive director of On Demand is Sitar Nieves. The senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. Yeah, this is the most people who've ever been able to see my bedroom. So at least those who are watching on the YouTube video. It's like I know I'm opening oh my myself up for all the jokes, oh but boy. had to be That's said. That's all right. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. We want our listeners to know us. Huh. Not that well.